Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. For the last several years, we've had a dream of building an entire kitchen right here in the workshop. Well, the time has arrived and we're going to do it soup to nuts. We'll start with kitchen cabinet basics and then we'll move on to specific areas. There'll be the hot wall where there's the oven and the stove. Then the wet wall where you'll find the sink, the dishwasher and related storage. Of course, every kitchen has to have a pantry and then we'll move on to the home office an island, and we'll finish up with a bar. The final episode will be dedicated to installing the cabinets themselves. Now it's gonna take several shows. And we're gonna get started today with Kitchen Basics, part one. Here's where we're gonna install the dream kitchen once we have it built. Now this kitchen functions perfectly fine. All the appliances are in the right place, the architecture is good, the windows are in the right place, the doors are in the right place, and the flow through it is good. It was built by the homeowner, who was a friend of mine about 30 years ago in his own shop. Problem is, now it's very tired. If you take a look at the cabinets, you'll see what I'm talking about. They look good on camera, but if you look at this door, which is made out of particle board and covered with laminate, which means it's very heavy, and these exposed hinges, you can see that they've loosened up because screws in particle board never hold very well. They could be fixed, but it's not going to last very long. The drawers have these metal runners. They're starting to rust. The nylon rollers are all worn out, so they're very sloppy. The sides are made out of exterior grade plywood, and that can be done better today. Down below the sink, where it's always wet and hard for paint to stay sticking to the surface, it's loosened up and even the laminates starting to peel off here. There's another issue with the countertops. We have varying heights. Up here, we're about an inch higher than this countertop. This should be all in the same plane. And this post form laminate top, that's deteriorated. The sink, it's gonna be hard to improve on that, so we're gonna hold on to that. Down here at these base cabinets, one of the problems is that they have deep shelves and it's hard to find everything without getting down on the floor. And there's a much better way to handle that. The upper cabinets, we do want glass panel doors. However, they need to be raised to accommodate these tall appliances. Another thing that we would like is a plane of cabinets and a refrigerator that's all in the same plane, rather than sticking out here about six inches. Today, they make refrigerators that are shallow, and that'll get pushed back. Over here, a pantry, a necessity in any kitchen. And uh, we could make some improvements with this as well. Painted shelves, they don't hold up very well. They could be placed better. And we could take advantage of the inside of this door for some additional storage. On this wall, we have a desk, and it works perfectly fine, except that it sticks out into the room too far. And these drawers are not quite wide enough to be used as filing cabinets. And also, in today's kitchen, you want to have a good communication center, a computer, and perhaps a nice flat screen monitor, and also more storage. That's always important. Over here, placed in the corner of the kitchen, which is the right place for it, a wet bar. We can make some improvements with this, mostly up on the wall here where we could put a cabinet for more storage. The bookcase is going to stay. The entranceway is good with coat storage as you come in the door. But we do have to do something with this island. Again, it's access to the storage. These doors are way under the overhang. It's hard to get to everything. We can fix that. We can make a better storage area for the wastebasket. And maybe it will get a little bit smaller and the top will change to a wood surface. So that's our mission over the next several programs. Next, what are we going to need? Well, one thing's for sure. You're not going to build the kitchen in place because that means ripping out the old kitchen first and you'll be without a kitchen for weeks, if not longer. Also, it's more difficult to build cabinets in place than it is to build them in a shop location. Now, if you don't happen to have a standalone shop like we do, how about your garage? It means the cars will have to take a vacation outside for a while, but just think what you're going to get, a brand new kitchen. And you need a fair amount of space. You're going to be handling big sheets of plywood, four by eight sheets of plywood. You're going to have stock in here. And once the cabinets are built, you're going to have to set them aside and store them till they're all complete. And you might even finish them in here. 
Also, you have to think about time. This is not a project you can do in just a weekend. It's going to take a long time to build this kitchen. And you have to budget that as well as money. You don't want to cheat on the quality of the materials you use, whether it be the wood and plywood or the hardware itself. Get the best hardware that you possibly can. Now, for design ideas, where do you go for those? Well, you could hire an architect or you could work with a kitchen designer. There are plenty of shelter magazines out there with pictures where you can get ideas. Uh, you could go on the internet and search around. And uh, you know, you could even look at TV shows. Now, for our project, we decided to get some inspiration and design ideas by taking a visit to a high-end kitchen hardware manufacturer where they have a number of displays that demonstrate what's available today to builders of kitchen cabinets. Dynamic space, what does that mean, Debbie? Dynamic space is the concept of kitchens that has cabinets chosen for the storage items and keeps them where you need them mm -hmm. while you're in the kitchen. Then why don't you show me around? We'll start off with a pantry that's usually beside a refrigerator, mm -hmm. keeping your food items. Okay, and these pull out. We put roll-ups, roll-outs up to a certain point with a shelf above. Those are items that you wouldn't typically be accessing mm -hmm. every day. But I could see everything clearly, so mm -hmm. it's easy to get at things. How about down below? No door. It looks like some drawers. It's all drawers. Mm -hmm. Now, am I going to get used to seeing my goods from the top rather than the front? Sure. It's a lot easier to see the items from overhead versus looking at a shelf and digging through the layers. And I suppose I'd have to stoop down if I was trying to look at the front of things rather right. than looking down. That's a good idea. Now, what's this? I don't think I've ever seen a wall cabinet that looks like this. This is called a Ventos. Go mm -hmm. ahead and lift it up. Oh, it's like an overhead door, sort of a bifold shape. Mm -hmm. So there's no doors that are opening out. Correct. Mm -hmm. The reason being, when you're emptying a dishwasher, you're always dodging that door when you stand up. I this can, pulls it up and out of the way. I can tell you, I've hit my head on many a door because it doesn't swing all the way around. Now, how about closing? Give it a nice little push. Wow, Same blue motion, that. opening and closing. Boy, it's nice and smooth. That's great. Now, how about below here? What are we storing down here? We have cutlery in organized trays that mm -hmm. are removable mm -hmm. for setting the table. Nice and neat. And how about down here? Dishes. Dishes in the drawers? Dishes in drawers. Huh. Go ahead and lift it out. You can carry it to the table and it's easy. Mm, it's Easier than idea. lifting. Now I got some big dishes. The little orange tabs on the side yeah. can extend the holder. Oh, so they're adjustable. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot easier lifting them out of this drawer than out of a cabinet way up high. Right. That's a good idea. Now, how about under the sink? That's usually lost space. Well, we made a U-shaped sink drawer. Ah, okay. So this wraps around the sink, and you've got these compartments, stainless steel. Yes. So I don't have to worry about it rusting. That's a great idea. Now, I must say, below the sink is usually the most disgusting place in anyone's kitchen. I hope you helped us with that. Yeah, we sure did. Just the bump of a knee, you can dump your trash. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You just bumped that with your knee? Sure did. Wow, that is neat. So you got all the household cleaners and the wastebasket. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Now the corner, that's always wasted space in most kitchens. And I'm seeing two banks of drawers. One has to be fake. You can't have two working against each other. We'll try and pull one out. Look at that. You've made a corner drawer. Yes. For all the items that you need for preparation. Wow. There's actually a lot of storage area in there. There is. And it closes nice and smooth. And the fronts will pull in. That's great. Now we're getting over near the cooktop. What are you storing here? Well, thinking about prepping, prepping your items and cooking your items, you have spices. Spices. And again, these are in a container, so you can bring them out to the stove or to the island where you're preparing food. And how about below that? Below that, we have bottles. Oh, bottles Oils, of vinegar, sauce. Olive oil. But you know, they always tend to, tend to run and they get all grimy down there. How do I clean that out? The bottom stainless steel tray pulls out and goes in the dishwasher. Hmm. Looks like there's another device in here. What's this? Oh, that's great. A place to keep all the aluminum foil and wrapping papers close to the stove. Yep. And uh, speaking of the cooktop, what do we store into that? Everything that you'd need while you're cooking. Wow. Utensils, pans, covers. You have your lids. Well, I must say you have got everything in the right place. But, you know, this is a very modern kitchen. And we're going to do a face frame kitchen, a more traditional look. What can you show me in that? Well, we have something upstairs. Let's take a look. Great. Ah, now here's a kitchen that people can relate to, a nice hardwood cabinet, in this case cherry. 
-hmm. And uh, does this have the same hardware as the one we saw earlier? It does. We have a lot of the same solutions for face frame cabinetry. Well, that works great on a wood door as well as it did on that very modern one. Mm -hmm. Now I see you've got an island here, and we're going to be dealing with one of those. And more drawers. This one's filled with pans, no doors. And I guess I'm starting to get used to that concept. I like the storage area in these drawers, and I like the smooth close. All of our runners have um, the Blue Motion soft close feature. Mm -hmm. um, it makes for a quiet kitchen, and consumers love a quiet kitchen. Mm -hmm. So this is not driven just by the engineering department. You're getting help from the buyers. Correct. We brought real people in. We did um, studies where we, we tested how often they access certain storage items. Um, we put a string on them to see how much they actually walk in the course of preparing a meal. And it told us, it helped us learn where to store certain items in the kitchen. Right. And so you're giving them exactly what they want. We are. All right. Well, thanks, Debbie. Thank this you. has been great. Well, that was a useful visit and definitely state-of-the-art. We'll be using some of those devices in our dream kitchen. Now, you can't build a kitchen without some power tools. And for me, it starts with this one, a good table saw, accurately tuned to cut nice and square and true, a very accurate rip fence, and extension tables to support the sheet goods as they're pushed through the saw, a couple accessories, a dado set. That will get used a lot and an accurate miter gauge. I also need a joiner. As good as the lumber is when it comes from the lumber yard, it's not good enough. I want to make sure the edges are straight and square, and this is the tool to get that done. I also want a router table. I can make moldings. I can cope and stick doors. There's a lot of things I can do with this machine. And I need clamps, a number of clamps because we're not going to use a lot of mechanical fasteners. A lot of this is going to be glued and clamped together. I need some handheld power tools, a plate joiner or a biscuit joiner to join the face frames to the carcasses. I need a drill driver. We're going to be drilling and installing a lot of screws in the carcasses, a pocket screw jig for the face frames, a dovetailing jig with a router to dovetail all the draw boxes, and, of course, there's going to be a lot of sanding. We'll need a few hand tools and a lot of glue. Now, for stock, there are a number of choices, and here are just a few. This is mahogany with a clear finish, and as you can see, it's beautiful, but a little bit pricey. Here's another choice. This is cypress, and it's a little bit softer, but we found that with a clear finish, it looks very nice. It actually looks kind of rich. Now, a wood that doesn't have a lot of grain, but it's pretty tough, is straight grain fir. And that's what that looks like with a clear finish. Reclaimed longleaf pine, which is hard and actually very nice with a clear finish. Now, you not, might not find too much of this, but this will make a nice kitchen. This is chestnut, a little bit of a heavy grain. If you're doing sort of an arts and crafts look, you might go with this, quarter sawn white oak. And here's one of my favorites. In fact, my kitchen is this. It's cherry. And that's just with an oil. Now, here we have maple, which can either be just regular flat grain maple, or if you get the tiger effect, that's pretty dramatic. And in our case, we're going to be painting the kitchen, so we're going to just use some poplar. Now for the sheet goods. We're going to need some of this, a pre-primed plywood. And I'll be using this on end panels, wherever the cabinet is going to show on the end, and that will take paint very well. We're going to need this material, medium density fiberboard. And we'll be using that for draw fronts and for the panels in the doors. Very stable, and it takes paint very well. And we're going to use a lot of this material, this pre-finished white maple plywood. It has a factory applied finish that's nearly indestructible. And we'll be using that for all the interior components. There are any number of styles to choose from. And I've mocked up a few that we can build here in the workshop. All of these examples are meant to be painted. But you could build them out of hardwoods and do a natural finish, the same styles. Here we have a simple face frame. No details on the edges, square edge cuts, rails and styles just joined together in a very simple manner. The door is known as an inset door, so the door sits flush to the face frame. 
It's installed with nine mortise hinges and that allows the door to open fully. On the inside edge of the door, there's this quarter round bead detail and a nice flat panel. For the draw fronts, the narrow ones will be a solid surface. And down below, if there were wide draws, they could also be solid or they could have a panel design in the middle, very much like the door. Here I have just a door, which could be used in any of these applications, except the panel has this bead detail. And you can get different types of bead board where the beads would be closer together or further apart, whatever your taste would be. This one has a rabbited door. You can see this 3 8 inch by 3 8 inch rabbit, and that partially overlays the face frame. The face frame on this example is built the same way the first one was. The door, however, does have the quarter inch bead, but a raised panel instead of a flat panel made out of MDF. The draw front mimics the panel, so we have that same detail sloping back. This one's a little fancier and takes a little more work to make. The face frame has this pencil bead detail around the edge. Once again, it's an inset door. It's on a mortised hinge that swings all the way around. And a flat panel with an applied molding that's just a bit proud of the surface of the door. The small drawers will be flat. The ones down below could be flat or, once again, mimic this detail in a panel. If you decide to build your own kitchen, a video of this program will be available and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. I want to start with basic cabinet construction and we'll start with the base cabinets. Here I have two pieces for the sides of a base cabinet. There'll also be a fixed top, a fixed bottom shelf, and a fixed back, all made out of three-quarter inch pre-finished plywood. And that's going to give us a nice strong carcass. Now the typical measurements for a base cabinet are 34 and a half inches in height, which allows for an inch and a half countertop for a 36 inch finished counter, and that's standard in the industry. When I add a face frame to the front edge, which is three quarters of an inch thick, I want the cabinet to finish out at 24 inches. That's also a standard in the industry. Now in a kitchen cabinet on the base, you want to have a toe kick. You want to have a place for your toes to go. It's much easier on the back. And that should be four inches high, and in this case, three and a quarter inches deep. First thing I want to do is make those cuts. But before I use any power tools, I want to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I've set up my dado to make grooves for all the panels that will connect the two sides. Now a groove for the back. The top and bottom panels also need a groove to receive the back at the same setting. Now a sacrificial fence because the next step is to make a rabbit along the top edge of the cabinet. The front edge of the bottom shelf is going to be exposed in the final assembly, so I want to cover it with a piece of edge band with a heat activated glue. This series of holes drilled through the grooves will be used for screws to assemble the case. This makes it easy to have the holes centered in the groove. Every joint is going to get glued. Now the back gets slid in place. 
before the glue sets up, I want to check the case for squareness, and that looks good. The next thing to do is to build a face frame, which wraps the carcass. That'll give me a place to attach the doors and make some drawer openings. Over here I have the parts for our face frame, some styles and rails. There are several different methods for joining face frame parts. Here's one, half lap joints. They get joined with glue and screws. Here I have a full mortise and tenon. It takes time to make these, but it's a very strong joint. Another method would be to use dowels with a doweling jig. And finally, pocket screws. We're going to use pocket screws for our frame. The first step is to drill an angled pocket in both ends of the rails. Now it's just a matter of a little dab of glue. Join the pieces together, clamp them so they stay nice and flush. And then there are these special screws which have a pan head and we drive that home. It's a fast method, and it's very strong. To attach the face frame, we'll use biscuits and glue, no mechanical fasteners. And of course, there's a corresponding biscuit slot in the frame. I've put glue in the slots, and now I want to run some in between each biscuit. Now I just bring all the pieces together and clamp it. Now in the past, I've attached face frames with finish nails, but no matter how you fill them and sand them, even with paint, they tend to show through. And on a natural finish, it's even more difficult. This method is far superior. It takes a little longer. Here I'm installing a backer for the toe kick, three quarter inch thick plywood. The length is the same as the width of the face frame. Now when the cabinets are installed, there'll be a joint between each cabinet. We'll unify all of that with a single strip, probably painted black or an appropriate color. And there you have it, one base cabinet with a face frame, the way I build them today. And it only took a few hours. Quite an evolution from that home-built kitchen that you saw earlier that my friend built over 30 years ago. Instead of fir plywood that had to be painted, we have pre-finished plywood that's very tough. Instead of a face frame joined with half-lap joints, glue, and screws, this one is assembled with pocket screws. They didn't even exist 30 years ago. And instead of attaching the frame with finished nails, this one is attached with biscuits and glue. No mechanical fasteners. We've come a long way in three decades. Now let me show you what we're going to do next time. Next time I'll be showing how to make doors, starting with this one. A partial overlay that has this rabbit along the edges and features a raised panel. <laughs> I'll also show how to make this inset door, which has a flat panel, and the corresponding draw front, as well as this style of draw front, the overlay draw front. And those fronts get attached to a box, which is made with dovetail joinery. And then we'll turn our attention up the wall to a wall-hung cabinet. We're going to have a lot to do. That's next time, right here in the new Yankee Workshop. Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the new Yankee Workshop. Today, part two of Kitchen Basics. We'll be building cabinet doors. We'll be making draw boxes, as well as the draw fronts. And we'll also build a wall-hung cabinet. That's next, right here in the new Yankee Workshop. Recently, I learned that there are over 25,000 cabinet shops in the United States. That was a surprise. With that many cabinet shops willing to build your kitchen, why would you want to build it yourself? 
well, maybe price might have something to do with it. And if you build it yourself, you're going to get exactly what you want. Now, recently, we paid a visit to a high-end custom cabinet shop right here in the Boston area, where craftsmanship is on display. And boy, they had a number of great ideas. Well, this is not my first visit here. And I got to tell you, one of the busiest persons here is Julie Edwards. And why not? She's the general manager. Now, Julie, we're trying to show people uh, what goes on here at your shop. And if you have a couple minutes, I'd love to have you show us around. I'd love to show you, but hopefully it won't take so long because right. we've got lots to do. All right. Well, we won't take too much of your time. Okay. Well, no, I'm on a good day. We have between 23 to 24 people that work in the shop. Mm -hmm. And we have Mike here who's assembling a wainscoting panel. Okay, so it looks like you got a frame out of maple and a nice panel, bird's eye maple. That's correct. That's gorgeous. And uh, there's another one over here. Over here, it goes to the same job, the door panels. Wow, that's quite a door. That's going to look gorgeous when it's finished. Yeah, we're very excited about it. Over here we have an interesting project that Mark's working on. It's like a white oak frame. Yes, it is. Oh, and a contrasting wood grill. That's going to look gorgeous. It is, and what Mark is doing is he's getting a snug fit. Mm -hmm. Now and the glass uh, looks like it's it's uh, got some kind of a coating on it. It's already installed. That's correct. What we do is we cover it so we can finish it all together, and then we remove it after finish. Good idea. Over at this workbench, we have Chick who's applying wood edges to his shelf. Uh huh. So I see some glue and clamps, no mechanical fasteners. Uh, glue and biscuits will do it. But well, Julie, the shop is nice and clean. Do you do that special for us? No, this is how it is all the time. You know, I'm not overwhelmed by the tools. They are pretty standard. Workbenches, plenty of clamps, ordinary tools. Basic tools is all it takes for most of the projects. Mm -hmm. Stuart over here is doing a soffit panel. All right, some glue and biscuits. And then over here we have John doing a curb cabinet. OK, so he's just edge banding this uh, pre-finished plywood. Correct. Over here we have Doreen who's sanding out a curved element. And we do this several times between coats. Well, it's the only way to get a good finish. That is right. Over here we have Chris spraying multiple coats in a high-tech spray room. Well, you know, I really wish that we were able to have one of these, but it's not practical for the small home workshop. No, but we're really proud of our finish, so we go the extra mile. Yeah, well, you should be. Your cabinets look great. Over here we have the assembly area where all the finishing touches get applied, and mm -hmm. that's what Chris is doing. So some assembly, some hardware goes on at this point. And uh, these look familiar. In fact, uh, this is very much like what we're thinking of doing. We want to build our carcasses out of this pre-finished plywood. You like using this? Yes, we do. Uh-huh. It looks like you've screwed it all together at the joints. Nice face frame, uh, pre-primed and a nice bead detail. I, I love this bead detail. We're thinking of possibly doing that. And uh, down here, you've held the frame below this bottom shelf, so that helps this uh, act as a stop for the doors. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. That's a good detail. And some European hinges and adjustable shelf pins. Nice quality cabinet. Thank you. Over here, we have Jason getting ready to assemble a cabinet. Uh -huh. So he's starting by installing some of the hardware. <laughs> You know, I've noticed as we've walked through the shop, no one's crazy busy here. I mean, they're really taking their time. Well, we find in order to do quality work, you need to take your time. Yeah, words of wisdom. So uh, how do we do for time? Well, it took a little bit much, but that's OK. All right, I'll let you get back to it. Thanks <laughs> Thank, a lot. Thanks, Norm. Well, now we're up in the showroom, and Paul Wright, one of the owners, is going to show us some of their greatest hits. Norm, here's a maple cabinet that we made for a customer. This is bird's eye maple panel. The frames mm. are plain maple. It's a face frame cabinet. There's a pencil bead that frames each opening. Mm -hmm. There are also furniture details here. A very profiled counter, a furniture base, some turned columns. You can see that we've used some high contrast material. The beveled glass adds another dimension to this too. Uh, it is a beautiful piece. Now what else do you have for natural woods? Well over here some longleaf pine. This is reclaimed material. This is a very strong, visually strong material. Mm -hmm. We love uh, this material. It's actually physically strong, too, which mm -hmm. is why this material was pretty much exhausted by the end of the 19th mm -hmm. century. But you can still get it reclaimed. You can still get it reclaimed, and we do often. 
Yeah. Nice detail here. You've used the same board for these two draw fronts. That's right. So they that match. grain carries right through. Mm -hmm. That kind of detailing is really important. Nice. Now how about painted cabinets? How popular are they? Well, this might have been a butler's pantry cabinet in a New England home, um, with one exception. This is a spray finish. These days, half of our cabinets are painted, and really? most of those painted cabinets are brush finished. Hmm. And they're brush finished because we design them to integrate with the running trim in the house. They're part of the architectural millwork of the house, mm -hmm. where you expect to see a brush finish. A little build up time going That's by. right. The brush surface gives you a sense of time. All right. Now, around the corner, uh, you have an overlay cabinet. No face frames here. That's right. These are full overlay cabinets. That means that the doors and the drawer fronts are directly mm -hmm. adjacent to one another. This whole construction is made possible by the concealed hinge. Mm -hmm. um, every cabinet maker loves the adjustability of a concealed hinge. Right. And uh, you can see that the reveals having those consistent are important because there's very little surface detail. This is a pretty crisp look. Right. It's got to be nice and neat and even. Now, one thing I saw when I walked in here, <laughs> drew my eye right to it, is this painted cabinet over here, this sort of tropical green, I guess I might call it. <laughs> This cabinet has a, uh, a very rich finish. There are several layers to this finish, a base coat of a solid color, mm -hmm. a wash coat of a very thin color. You can see it's a little bit darker. Mm -hmm. And then there's some clear coat over that. That adds more depth to this finish. Also, darkening this sticking or this molding, uh, again, adds a little more depth. It makes this withdraw mm -hmm. a little bit further. It's a very nice finish. Now, I've also noticed that on the end panel, it's not just a plain surface, and we'll be dealing with those as well. Here you've used beads, a beadboard look. That's right. End panels of cabinets are very important. They're often overlooked. They play as much of a role in the design and look of something as the faces do. Sometimes we bead them. This one's another example of a much more elaborate way of handling an end. Um, but it's important to take these things seriously and incorporate them into the design of the mm -hmm. cabinetry. Now, how about glass panel doors? We're going to be dealing with some of those. Glass panels provide a challenge for, for, for construction, and these are actually put in with a stop. So this pane of glass has four pieces holding it in place. Mm -hmm. um, this happens to be a divided light door. Uh, these could also be single light doors, in which case um, you don't have as much of a reason to align your shelves with these muntins. Right. I think with the muntins, you want to have them aligned. So if you start shifting them around, a solid panel would work better. A single panel works better. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been great. And as we embark on this project, do you have any special words of wisdom for us? Norm, I could say that kitchens last a long time. Yeah, they do. Uh, good craftsmanship matters, but the details really matter. All right. Well, we'll keep that in mind. OK. Thanks. All right. Well, I hope it was reassuring to see those craftsmen using tools and techniques that would be familiar in any well-equipped workshop, except for maybe that spray booth. Let's start today talking about doors. I want to do a very simple door to start out with. This one has a beadboard panel, but it could be a simple flat panel, or it could be a raised panel. The inside edge is square, as well as the outside edges, and it's joined together with a tongue and groove joint. Over here, I have the parts for another door rails, styles, and a blank for the panel. I want to start by making the grooves. Now, before we use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. In order to center the groove, I flip it end for end and run it through again. Here I've installed my sacrificial fence, which partially conceals my dado. And it also controls the length of the tenons that I need. A pass on each side will form the tenon. All right, these are how the pieces slip together. There'll be plenty of glue surface there and a nice tight joint. I also get the groove for the panel. I like to make the panels out of 3 8 inch thick stock because it's stiffer. However, that means I'll have to rabbit the back edge to make it fit in the quarter inch groove. With glue on the tenon and in the groove, I'll slip the rails in on each end. 
And then the panel with no glue. I'm going to let that float. Now the other style. Okay, now a couple clamps, set it aside, and when it's dry, a little sanding to flush up the joints, and that's one door ready to go. Now let's build a door that's a little more complicated. This one is a rabbited door. It has this 3 8 rabbit that overlays the face frame slightly. It also has a raised panel and a nice bead detail that wraps around the inside. Over here I have the rails and styles for a door. And here's the joint, a breakdown of the joint. Here's the profile with the bead and a groove for the panel. This is known as the stick. Here's the piece that has the tenon or the cope cut. And these cuts are made with a router bit set at the router table. The door making set comes with two bits. This one makes the bead and the groove for the panel as well as the tenon on the rails. This one makes the cope and the tenons. I've set up the bit. Now, running the piece through with the narrow end is impossible with freehand and even with a miter gauge. So what I want to do is use this coping sled. It just slides on the table. To set the piece, I first bring the sled against the fence, then the piece of stock against the fence and lock it in place. As I push it through, I want to make sure I keep the sled tight to the table. Now I've installed the bit which will make the stick on all four edges, and I have a feather board to keep the stock tight to the table. Here's a piece of 3 quarter inch MDF, medium density fiber board, that I'm going to use for the panel. I like this because it's very stable and it paints up great. Now I'm going to remove a lot of material with this panel raising bit, so it'll take several passes to get it exactly where I want it. Now the edge of my panel is a little thick to fit in the groove I made earlier. So I'm going to use the dado and wrap at the back until it fits. All right, a little glue on all the joints. And again, the panel is not going to be glued. It's just going to float. Now the other side, and we'll apply a couple clamps. All right, we'll let that set overnight, and tomorrow I'll round over the edges and make the rabbit for the overlay. Well, good morning. I got started today removing that door we made yesterday from the clamps. It's all nice and solid, it's square, it's strong, and it's flat. I'm sanding all the joints nice and smooth, the next thing I want to do is round over these outer edges with a quarter inch radius for looks. The final step is to make that rabbit around the inside edge, which will give us that overlay feature. The door just sets into the face frame. And what I like about this system is there's a little bit of play, left and right and up and down. So if the face frame isn't perfectly square, you're never going to know. There are hinges available that wrap around the rabbit and attach to the face frame. That's for later. Now I want to work on a drawer. A drawer is nothing more than a box with a bottom. And I like to join the sides to the front with dovetail joinery because that's where all the stress is. Pulling on that drawer front puts stress on the joint. With glue alone, this is a very strong joint and it's never going to come apart. For material, I'm using a pre-finished plywood. It's very similar to the material we used on the base cabinet. And it has one edge that's pre-finished. Now, you're going to pay a little bit more for this material, but it's completely finished, it's nice and smooth, and it looks great. I'm going to make the dovetail joints over here at my dovetail jig. There's a template, and I use a router with a collar. The collar follows the fingers of the template. The setup is to put the side of the drawer, the inside side facing out, and here we have the front facing up. When I route the joint, I cut both the tails and the pins at the same time. OK, 
Okay, let's see how we did. The edges line up nicely and a few taps with the mallet. Nice tight joint. To join the back of the box to the side, I simply use a dado joint. There's no stress there. To make that joint, I use my dado once again, and I have a stop block to locate it correctly. The bottom for our drawers will be quarter inch pre-finished plywood, which is nice and clean and looks great, matches the sides. However, it's not quite an exact quarter inch. In fact, it's just under that. But I want a nice tight groove, so I've cut one in a sample here. And you can see that it's just snug. And I start the groove a half inch up from the bottom of the sides. And I have to use my saw blade to get a nice fit with a couple passes on all four pieces. Well, let's glue it together. And look at how many places I have to distribute the glue around all these dovetails. That's really going to hold it together. Okay, now I slide the bottom in. Get it engaged with the front. Okay, and now I put some glue in the dados. And the back goes in last. And a couple brads until the glue sets. Well, that does it for the box. Now let's make a draw front out of MDF that'll match the style of the door. I'm using the same bit that I used to raise the panel on the door except that I've moved the fence forward because I don't need the part that slips into the groove. Now I've switched over to a 3 8 inch radius roundover bit and I just want to soften this edge. I secure it to the box with a few screws. All right, we're not going to bother with the hardware right now, but that's what it's going to look like. Now all we need is a wall cabinet. A wall cabinet is nothing but another box. Two sides, a bottom and a top, as well as a back. Everything is made out of three-quarter inch pre-finished plywood, just like the base cabinet unit that I built. Now the back, it's very important that that be three-quarter inch plywood because that's what's going to take all the stress. A wall cabinet doesn't sit on the floor, it's hanging on the wall, so it has to be very strong. Now we're going to start by making some rabbits and dados to join the pieces together. The first step is to make a dado on each side piece for the back. You'll note that I held the groove for the back in from the back edge of the panel about 3 eighths of an inch. That will allow me some room to scribe the cabinet if the wall is out of plumb, and it will also allow for slight variations in the wall, in the plaster or in the studs. Now that's a dado for the bottom shelf, and you'll notice that I held it up from the bottom of the cabinet, and now I'll leave a pocket to conceal any lights. Here the setup changes. I've installed a sacrificial fence so I can make a rabbit to receive the top of the cabinet. Before we do any assembly, I want to drill some holes in the sides to receive these shelf supports. Here's one style of pin. We want to be able to adjust the shelves. So I'm going to use this template, which has an edge guide, which holds it in the right position, and it has a series of holes evenly spaced. I align it with the center of the cabinet, 
And using this drill bit, which is a centering bit, has a collar here. And when it slides down to the bottom, that gives me the correct depth. It's a three millimeter diameter bit. This little collar sits in the jig. I'll drill a series of holes on this side, turn the jig around, drill another series on the other side. Okay, I have to turn it around. Before we start any assembly, I want to edge band this bottom shelf. Just as before, I'm going to pre-drill for the screws and countersink from the other side. Have a little glue in that dado. Now another face frame using the same techniques as earlier. And the screws do the work. Now some slots for biscuits, both in the carcass and the face frame. glue in the slots and along the edge of the case. All the biscuits are installed. I've also put glue in the slots of the face frame. And now I just get it all put together and we'll apply some clamps. Now by using this method, we avoid the use of any nails or screws, which we would have to conceal later. Now the shelf couldn't be easier. Another piece of the pre-finished plywood, some biscuits, and a piece of one inch poplar that I like to use because it'll make the front edge of the shelf stiffer and that will eventually get painted to match the cabinet. And there you have it, one basic wall cabinet, complete except for the door which will be specified later. And this should last at least 30 years. Next time we're actually gonna start building the dream kitchen using some of the techniques you've seen today. We're going to start in an area we refer to as the hut wall, where the fire is, the built-in double oven, the range, and the range hood, as well as related storage. Now over here, there are a lot of problems. It's very, a lot going on actually. You've got a 36 inch range and a 42 inch hood. That's crowding this space. We have a void here that we're not getting any use out of. And I'm going to make it worse because I'm going to build this cabin a little bit bigger. There's going to be a lot to do, but I know we can do it. That's next time right here in the new Yankee Workshop.